What is the condition of free speech in America today? I'm Sanford Unger, director of the Free Speech Project at Georgetown University. And on this series, Speaking Freely, we're talking from time to time with thought leaders and major players in the free speech drama unfolding in America. Today, I'm joined in the studio by Mark Howard, a professor of government and law at Georgetown University, and by Vince Greco, a man who was incarcerated for more than three decades and now advocates for prisoner rights. Mark Howard, Vince Greco, uh, when most people think about free speech issues, I think, I, I think it takes a while for them to come down to the notion that this might be a problem and a controversial topic in prisons and jails. Uh, can, can you uh, give me a sense of this, Mark, of what sure. kind of problem it has become? Yeah, I think, frankly, much of society doesn't think about prisoners or prisons in general, which is a problem. Um, but when they do, I think most people have no realization of how few rights people in prison have. Uh, in terms of free speech, there are very limited free speech rights that apply to mail, um, that apply to communication with families, but it's very easy for prisons to override that by asserting that there's a security need. And so security kind of trumps everything. Um, and so, for example, they can, there's a right to libraries in prisons, but many books are banned. Prisons, very, uh, for very arbitrary reasons, will come up with a list of books. And sometimes it's you know, classics, Catcher in the Rye has been banned. And other times, more recent books that deal with criminal justice, like the New Jim Crow, has been banned in, in hundreds of prisons. Who makes those decisions? Who decides what Prison they're... officials, generally, so on an individual prison or... level. And sometimes it's at a state level as well. But usually it's wardens who make a decision. Or it's somebody even within the state. It might be the librarian who might even be working part time, who mm -hmm. just says, oh, no, not this book. Um, or same thing with mail. Mail gets censored. Some magazines or some books that get sent to people, somebody in a mailroom might say, nope, this isn't getting through. I don't like it. And there's just very little recourse because people who are incarcerated have so few rights. Is all the mail opened in prisons? All the mail is open except for legal mail. Legal mail is the one privileged mail so right. where the content cannot be viewed by prison administrators. But otherwise, all mail is opened, but including they packages. Do open it, me. They, they do open it in your presence, uh -huh. uh, the legal mail. So they do search it. Even the, li even the mail that doesn't get right, they can't read screened. It. Right. right. And, and uh, how, do you, how does one make this point? I mean, I imagine the pushback would be, uh, well, these people in prison were sentenced to, to be there because of some crimes they committed, they, they were convicted of. Right. And so they forego certain rights. For, have forfeited certain rights as That's a result. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think that clearly the fact that somebody has committed a crime and is in prison, there's a certain measure where you want to make sure that they're not being incited to or having the opportunity to incite others to commit further crimes and pursue criminal activity. So there's obviously a justification for some control and some intervention that's different from out in free society. The problem is that it's gone so far to the extreme of complete control and intervention, and also in a very arbitrary way with very little recourse because there's not exactly a prisoner's rights lobby or anything like that. But the tough on crime movement, and particularly the victim's right lobby, which we can something we can talk about because it's very complex, has pushed so far in a direction of depriving people of even basic communication rights, basic keeping ties with their loved ones much less having rights to have their voice and image used outside of prison. 
and that's something that's been severely restricted so, in, in so recent the years. The operating assumption seems to be um, just being here is not punishment enough, that you have to be deprived of some other rights as part of the, part of this, the unwritten part of your sentence. That's right, and that's right. where I think the U.S. really stands out compared to other countries where the deprivation of liberty, so the separation from society, is the punishment. In this country, we add on all kinds of additional punishments, and Vince can, of course, talk about this from personal experience as well. Vince, what, what, what happened with you? I think uh, what, what Mark was saying about the book ban, so I went into prison in the early 80s, and there really wasn't that many books that were banned. It was pretty, pretty wide open, and then all of a sudden, somebody came in and they decided, well, we don't need chemistry books because we don't want them to learn how to make different chemicals. We don't need... Theoretically for bombs or yeah, something. For, 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 or, 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 yeah. Or to or, learn how to make them. Or to learn how to, to make them. To use them on the outside. To right. use them on the outside. Uh, anything to do with the manufacturing of, of weapons and things like this. So this is where I first experienced it. And, and then we came, uh, came to know what is you know, the uh, Son of Sam law which then prohibits uh, prisoners from writing about their crimes and making a profit off of their, their uh -huh. individual crimes. So what, what uh, Mark has said, though, is that it has now just snowballed. And so and now we're dealing with no common sense when it comes to what books are banned. The new Jim Crow, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Why to ban that? Um, well, personal level, what happened to me was they took a I was uh, attaining uh, a graduate degree from Cal State University through correspondence, and they came in and took all my political science books. They took Rousseau, they took Machiavelli, they took Plato's Republic, they took all these. What was dangerous about those? Um, well, there, there, there are certain things. A, a lot of people use uh, Machiavelli and um, <laughs> Art of War, you know, but I didn't have that one. I had actually a Kim Jong Il book that, that I was uh, <laughs> that I was uh, that was part of my course requirements so. though, and yeah. so you know I had to go through a whole lot to this get back. This was the North Korean dictator, right? North Korean before the current one, right? before the current one, and it was uh, it was just part of, of the curriculum from Cal from Cal State, and you know they, they just came in and got them. You know they let me have them, you had them all highlighted, but then they came and got them and. But I ended up getting them back. It was a hard fight. How did you get them back? Well, I went through the grievance processes. You know, it's a long, could take up to two years ago to get your case in the circuit court. Uh, so I see. To, so you had to go to court to get your books back. No, I wanted at the level below. I see. Uh, within the prison? With it, well, within, no, a separate entity, the uh, grievance office. I see. So it's like of the Department hearings. of Corrections or whatever right, it's called. Yeah. Right, right for all executive branches. And I've even heard about President Barack Obama. While he was president, his books were banned in a facility where somebody received them and uh, the person in the mailroom decided, no, no, these are dangerous, while he was the current president, which is, of course, in Seems any circumstances, unusual. outrageous. Yeah. Right. So um, I, I'd just like to try to, maybe it's speculation, sort of think about w why, uh, say, victims' movements in particular would would push so hard for this and what they would, do they feel they're achieving something? I mean, it, it, do we have to try to understand what they're thinking? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a very legitimate reason to think carefully about the impact on victims, about having perpetrators of crimes that harm them have their names and images in the public, particularly if it's somehow profiting and it of seems the to crime sort of getting notoriety. glamorize these people. Right, right. Crimes. And that's, that's a real danger, and we don't want that to happen. So I don't have a problem with restriction of somebody causing harm to another person while they're in prison based on what they've done before. That said, what it's, re it's reached a point, and it's continuing, where that is interpreted so broadly, and often without even consultation an explanation with the people, where essentially the default is to erase people as human beings when they're in prison, so that they can't have an opportunity 
to have their voice and name out there. If journalists contact them, the requests are often denied because of the fear of supposedly re-injuring victims. So I don't want to say that it's a fabricated fear, but it's just grossly exaggerated and it's completely out of proportion. As a result, their First Amendment rights of incarcerated people have been just grossly abridged and continue to be, and I think that's very troubling. Is there anyone fighting to change this? Um, no, not at this time uh, that I know of. The ACLU has been. The ACLU has, ACLU has, has been filed some things. Yeah, right. the I don't imagine it's a popular cause project. for a, I don't right. imagine it's a popular cause for a politician to take it. No, no, it's not. But we have to, well, we have to protect the victims. And you agree with that? Oh, absolutely, absolutely, 100 percent. There's no reason why a, a victim should be, you know, watching the news, evening news, and all of a sudden the perpetrator of, right. of a crime against their loved one is up there talking about positive things, or, or being uh, writing in uh, uh, articles or whatever that are sadistic towards the victims or sadistic. Toward, could be interpreted that way. Could be right. interpreted that way, but then the flip side of it is how do you balance it so that a person that's innocent, he cannot write a book or cannot write a newspaper article or do a TV interview to put forth his side of the, uh, or her side of the story. And so how do you balance it out? Mm -hmm. But, I, but I, I agree we have to be, uh, we have to have a, a way to do it, and specifically in Maryland, they have the victim notification law, and I agree with it. I think that they should have the victim notification. If a victim, Maryland is where you were in prison. Yes. If, if victims sign a piece of paper that say, I want to be notified uh, when, when this person goes for parole, when he's going to court, when they go to re, uh, release, or um, and now the, the media. And so they want to be informed of every, you know all the movement. And so what I think that has done is that it has um, just, instead of notifying the victim and seeing if they have an uh, issue with it, um, they just don't notify and just say automatically no. And I think... Why yeah, is that? Because I, I think it's per perhaps too overwhelming. Too much uh, trouble. Too much trouble. Much trouble. And then, and then the, the, again, the, the facts have, have been, I've seen it over the years, where um, even for parole, open parole hearings where victims can come, that their address has changed and they didn't update it, and so therefore, so there, there, there's a you know a lot, of, a lot of complicated, and you know even if the uh, prison were to call and say hey you know leave a message, a person probably doesn't want to listen to it anyway, and so if it's that painful, and so I really haven't come up with the balance, but there has to be a balance somewhere because. Uh, uh, a lot of rights are getting violated sure. with this. Uh, Mark, does this have an no. impact on sort of recidivism or how people feel coming coming out of prison? Yeah, I mean, there's. I can't give you an exact you know figure in terms of. I don't think it's possible to to right. even find. It's very hard to to in terms of the impact of the free speech. But one thing that's very clear is that the the two main things that lower recidivism are contact with family and continuity. And, and connections with the outside are one, and the second is education and programming, which has just a tremendously positive uh, impact on people and prepares them for success when they get out. And Vince is actually a perfect example of that on both fronts, actually. So, um, but what this does is it deprives people of, of contact with the outside. What those who push these laws and policies um, are really doing is trying to wipe these people off the face of the earth. But the problem is 95% of people will be coming home. And so what are we actually doing? By, it, it's, so it's, it's completely it's damaging. It's well-intentioned, but it, in, in a fashion. I think it's well-intentioned in the most abstract sense. Right. But the way it's applied is applied very maliciously. It's to simply completely erase people from the face of the earth while they're in prison. And that's just very damaging even to ourselves as a society. Of course. And we, and we try to, in one prison, that I was in, we tried to rebuild that because you know we were labeled inmates, prisoners, convicts, and we tried to put that back in perspective and called ourselves incarcerated citizens because we don't lose all our rights. We are citizens of, of the United States, 
and we're going to be returning th those that you know, our citizens have already returned to the community, 95% of them, as Mark said, and how do we want them coming out? Do, do we want them coming out uh, always feeling they have a scarlet letter over th their face, that they can't move forward, that they can't do, do anything, and then they get frustrated and, um, you know, just the other day I heard of a, guy, a person got out and couldn't handle the, the pressures and committed suicide. Mm. And so, because they, they're, they're fearful of going back to such an environment that, that just, it, 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 in the milieu of it all, it just loses its whole humanity. And then if people are just being overall treated on a lower level of humanity, but then you expect them to come out and be on a higher level of humanity. It just doesn't make sense to me. What is the uh, prospect for changing this? What, are, what is the hope for changing it? Do you feel like a, a voice in the wilderness? A little bit. I mean, there is a constitutional right that prisoners have. and Which I has think been affirmed a, by the Supreme Court? It's been affirmed by the Supreme Court, but not really very clearly defined. And so it's left a tremendous amount of leeway and in interpretation to prison officials to decide whether there's sort of a security reason for a restrictive policy and infringement on people's First Amendment and other rights. And so I think there could potentially be challenges to that. And there have been some, and I think the ACLU has been active on this in terms of banning of certain books and mm -hmm. the rights of people who are authors who are writing about fiction, let's say, have nothing to do with their own crime. I think we can all agree that somebody writing a book that is about their crime and tries to profit from it is, is something that shouldn't be allowed. But what if somebody's a good writer or a good artist or, or you know, has talent in other areas? They're still a human being, and if that talent is recognized and, and rewarded, shouldn't they be able to receive something from that, their families? We have, uh, there's an author in the state of Michigan who is a very successful, it turns out now, and, mm -hmm. and, all, and who has a, a wife and two children, and the state is trying to take over 90% of the royalties and of the income saying well and then charging it back as sort of rent for a room and board for being incarcerated that to me is is is, is a complete infringement of that person's rights um, but it's all done in the name of service to victims which again is something i take very seriously and i know vince does too and has for a long time but it's something that has just gone too far we're out of whack here it's just become unreasonable and uh, I think there are strong First Amendment challenges that could be made legally. There's not much movement on that front. It's, as you said, it's not a big political issue. It seems as if you would need uh, advocates, sponsors of such an effort who would command public approval. I think that's right, yeah. And I don't think elected officials are really no, in a need some to movie doing stars. That. Or yeah, you need maybe, yeah, some movie stars or celebrities perhaps to draw attention to that. And, I mean, that's not impossible. It's something that's, right. that's plausible. Um, I think there has been a lot of movement on overall criminal justice reform. I think there's been tremendous progress on humanizing people who've made mistakes in the past and helping support them for reentry. I think it's something we're seeing across the political spectrum. It's not a partisan issue. I'd like to see this First Amendment free speech issue become a part of that movement as well. It's not quite there, but I think it could be. Is, is this a, an issue in federal prisons, by the way? It's an issue in all prisons, all federal, prisons. state. Yeah, about 10% of overall prisoners are in federal prisons, 90% are in right. state prisons, but right. it's an issue all around. Is it any yeah. better in federal prisons? Is there more hope for improvement of these restrictions in, on the federal level? I can't level? say for sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I really don't know that one. But I can tell you in Maryland, because of security concerns, they attempted to limit only postcards coming into the prison. They limited Christmas cards and birthday cards from coming into the prison. So yes, you know, that's a way that some contraband was introduced into the prison, but- In birthday cards? Uh, yeah. Christmas well, cards. Some drugs that right, could be smuggled know, in that way. Different, well, th that's why you have security in your mail room and that's why you open up the cards to find right. this contraband or use drug sniffing dogs or, you know, you come up with a, a, another, another form of, of how to deal with it and saying that they're uh, putting pressure on Maryland prisoners' families that you can only uh, hug at the end of a prison, uh, at the end of a visit. 
whereas before you used to get the hug in, in you know, before, and then you can't, but how do you tell a six-year-old kid when your father's sitting as close as me or the mother, no, you can't touch them, you can't touch them. You know, and it's very before they used to be able to touch them. And, and how, do, how do the children respond to that? So they really have uh, focused hard on the security aspect without looking again at the humanity of everybody from, from the, the family of the prisoner to the victim and to the prisoner. Is it worse in some place? It sounds as if Maryland is particularly um, strict, it which is. sounds seems ironic because Maryland is thought of as a progressive, so-called blue state. Et Not so much on criminal justice, unfortunately. Oh, we're purple there. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, but it is worse in some places than others, but not always in the most predictable ways. Um, it's not as if uh, you know, it's, a, it's a strictly partisan issue and, and it's um, automatically worse in states that, have, um, that are more politically conservative or anything like that. Um, New York, uh, certainly a very blue state, recently uh, had a, a scandal surrounding the banning of books um, that uh, shocked people, and, it, and it's something that um, got some attention, and then the governor pulled it back. The governor didn't even realize it. So it, this is also how it's not even clear who's leading on these issues. Sometimes it could just be one individual who has very little maybe education or training or has thought very little about it, but decides, I don't like something, or I'm just going to pass some policy. And it just gets implemented. Sure. And no one really knows why. And then, you know, People then complain to, let's say, a governor. A governor says, this is, this is crazy, and then stops it. But had there not been but everybody complaining, had, it might right, not have someone gotten Someone has to, to notice and complain exactly. and institute and, process. and most things that happen in prison, right. people don't hear about. There, there are violations that take place on a daily basis, all kinds of, of violations of people's constitutional rights, infringements on what they're supposed to be able to have, whether it's if they're in solitary confinement, time outside, or whether it's communication with visitors. And all they get to do is go through the grievance process, which usually right. doesn't work. I mean, Vince, you yeah. were successful that time, but 99% yeah. you know, of grievances go nowhere. Mm -hmm. And so it's extraordinary how few rights overall there are to people who are incarcerated because it's kind of like no, they're crying in the, you know, in the forest and no one's there to hear right. it. On this thing about books, I, I uh, understand that in Texas, for example, it's okay to read Hitler's Mein Kampf, mm -hmm. but yeah. not okay to read certain more uh, progressive, yeah. more, yeah. more <laughs> admirable American. Yeah. What sort of yeah. things are banned in Texas as far well, as? Well, I mean, I think a lot of books that deal with racial politics. I see. Um, that right. deal with black power, that are very political, that are revolutionary, you might say. Um, and s for whatever reason, Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow, for many people, falls into that category, even though right. that's really a. She's just a documenting the. The rise in mass incarceration right. and explaining it. And so in doing so, that's viewed as perhaps revolutionary right. because it's actually opening people's eyes to the reality that has engulfed them. It's in interesting lives. that she's now going to be the head of a major foundation yeah. uh, dispensing philanthropy for good causes. Right. And yeah, I think that's things. a great development. Yeah, that is right. great. I yeah. wonder, so, wonder if she'll take on this cause to try to write Right, some of yeah. these wrongs. I hope so. I think so. And, and as Mark said, I think, and you pointed out, all different prisons have all different rules and regulations, and a lot of them are made by mid-level administrators. And how do we bring it together under the Constitution and protecting everyone's constitutional rights? I mean. You know, quite frankly, we're having a gun debate now. How do we deal with that, with that constitutional right? And the same thing has to happen here. Um, just real quick on a personal experience. Uh, I was in a group of, we called ourselves the Extra Legalese Group. And we held what we call a, a peace initiative. And we were bringing together the various gangs inside the prison and we were bringing in over 100 outside people. We brought in victims, uh, victims mm. of crime. We brought in state's attorneys. We brought in civic leaders. And it was a, a three-day, four-day seminar. We in had prison. A, in the prison with over 900 prisoners participating. So we did this for two years. 
and our group was generally consisted of six people uh, that organized and bring up, brought all the other groups under our umbrella, like per se. Well, we were given the award, Innovator of the Year Award, by the Daily Record, which is Maryland's legal, legal newspaper. Legal newspaper, right. Right. And so during that time, they had a war ceremony. Of course, they weren't going to let us go there, but it was you know, a nice place. But they wanted to come in and make a video like they did for every other recipient of the award. And four out of the six people were not allowed to be videotaped. So then when our families go and we had the, even the, the warden when he uh, half accepted the award with a couple victims that we, you know, that we chose to accept the award on our behalf, but our families were there, but they couldn't see, my family couldn't see me, the, the other two guys and the other three guys with me. Uh, we actually ended up winning that appeal through the circuit courts, but it was way too late. We just did it, try to set a standard. Symbolically. Yeah, and so, uh, yeah, it's just, it makes no sense. Well, you know, um, there, there are ways to deal with it. You know, this is something positive that was happening. So it's not something going out and, and being negative, you know, and yeah. it's just very tough, uh, tough to figure one, out. One, one last issue I wanted to raise, which is how uh, are prison education programs doing? I have had some involvement with this myself in the past as a president of a small college. Yes. And are, is the prison education movement growing? Is that? It is growing. And is that something that victims are opposed to? Um, no, as far as I know, and I hope they don't become so. Prison education is the no-brainer issue involving right. criminal justice reform right, because right. it's been proven, the RAND Corporation did a major meta-study that shows that it reduces recidivism by 43 percent, has incredibly positive impact. Vince has been a part of this through the changes that he was able to make uh, in prison through education, and I've seen it happen in countless people. And that's when we first met, actually, was when he was still incarcerated, and I was teaching in a prison. And it, it's an incredibly powerful and empowering experience to give people the tools to learn and grow and prepare them to succeed for when they were released. And what the RAND Corporation found is every dollar spent on prison education has a four to five dollar return in terms of reducing future incarceration costs by lowering recidivism. Plus, obviously, fewer victims, you know, less right. crime, safer communities. I mean, it's an absolute no-brainer. There has been a lot of progress. Uh, more and more programs are coming about, and Georgetown has been very involved, I'm glad to say, and it's one of, been some, one of my initiatives is to create a Georgetown prison education program and there are a number of other universities. Goucher College was one of the early ones, and I think it's done a phenomenal job. I think, um, uh, personally, I went in with eighth grade education, attained a uh, bachelor's degree from Cal, uh, Coppin State College, and then got my graduate degree from Ca uh, California State College. So first you had to do a high school equivalency right. degree, and then you did BA, graduate degree. Correct. And I found that it was so freeing that this was what fr freed me and was able to take uh, blinders off of my of my eyes and be able to really deal with the good, the bad, and the ugly of per why I was inside. And um, I just thought it was so powerful that that's why I stayed at in education. And I tutored in the daytime and ran the in prison in prison and and the college. Uh, um, it was a college clerk, you know, at, at nighttime. And, um, you know, it might not sound like, like, like a lot, but I was making a dollar a day. I could have went to several other jobs where I was, could make five, six dollars a day. That helps out a little bit. But um, education is so important. And as Mark uh, pointed out, is that we are talking about the reduction of victimization of innocent people. When you have 95% success rate with a program, who in their right mind, and the, the, the cost saving, okay, cost, yeah. no, how much money can you put on, a, you know, another crime and another victim when, you know, that's not even talk about money when you talk about victimization. Sure. So I think that it's just so important, and uh, George Hound came in on a volunteer basis, and when the Pell Grant went down, college, some colleges stepped up and were expected to fill the void. 
a lot of a lot of colleges did, but then it waned off a little bit because the prison really didn't want it in there. And then now it flourished back up again, and that's when Georgetown came in. University of Baltimore has a program. Goucher, as he said, was is in two prisons. Um, and Andrew Arundel County is the uh, community college. Is the That's a, a, a community college in Maryland. Right. And, and, and so, nationwide, there are really m many programs, and they've been right. flourishing and extremely successful in terms of the reentry prospects of their students. So perhaps there's some grounds for optimism that the growth of prison education programs might lead gradually to restoration of free speech rights. And Absolutely. Well. But there is an irony, which is that many of the students who are in those programs still do not have their free speech rights. In other words, if uh, a newspaper or, or radio or other a media broadcast wants to come into a prison to and interview people, many of the people who are students in those programs who are doing really well, who might have you know a 3.9 GPA and be excelling in every respect, they still can't have their picture shown or their name used. And I think there's just something wrong with that. Thanks very much, Mark and Vince, for talking with us today. Thanks for having Thank us. Thank you. Thank you for having us. We've been discussing the free speech rights of the 2.3 million incarcerated Americans. To learn more about Georgetown University's Free Speech Project, visit our website. Thanks for watching. I'm Sanford Unger.